All right, verse 14. And let it come to pass. So remember, the servant is praying. So I'm just going to review it quickly. The servant is asking, make sure that, uh, let it so happen to be that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, whichever damsel or young woman that he says to, uh, he says to, let down thy pitcher. So use your pitcher to draw out water. I pray thee that I may drink and she shall say, drink. When the servant asks this woman, I beseech you, I pray thee, so that I can drink some water, that the woman's going to respond, drink, and the woman will also add to that, and I will give thy camels drink also. She's also going to say, I'm going to give your camels drink as well. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. The servant's praying to God, let that same damsel, that young woman, be the one that you've appointed, that you've chosen to be the bride for your servant Isaac. And thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. Meaning, from this I'm going to know that you showed kindness to my master Abraham, to Isaac, if you were to do this for me. Now remember in Genesis verse by verse Bible study, as I've said so many times, I explain each and every word. So if it sounds redundant or slow, uh, don't think that way. Take that as an opportunity instead, as I explain verses, that you look at the verse the same time and see if the explanation matches it. If it does, then that means, if it matches, then that means I'm not a heretic, okay? So I'm in the safe zone. So please make sure to pay attention, and that way you can understand each and every word from the Bible yourself. That's a common complaint from people nowadays is the King James Bible is too hard to understand. Well, the problem actually is that people don't actually just read and study for themselves. So that's why we do this class to help you. I mean, uh, I'm not too hard on these people. I mean, majority of my people, when they started reading the King James Bible. It was hard, and even for me as well. But until we actually read and studied word for word, then a lot of it became common sense gist. Yeah. So as I explain the verses, you're going to find out s somewhere in your unconscious mind that common sense gist is going to pop out and explain for you while I'm explaining. So your understanding is going to sink in with mine surprisingly, you will come to find out. And if you don't think so, then play along with this experiment with me and let's see. Verse, verse 15, the Bible says, And it came to pass, before he had done speaking, so it just so happened to be, uh, before, right before he just finished speaking, his prayer to the Lord, that behold, Rebekah came out. That lo and behold, behold is a favorite word used throughout the book of Genesis. That basically behold means it just so happened to be, look, this is something to pay attentive to. That's what that word is used as that metaphor. Rebecca is the one that came out. So then Rebecca came out and Eliezer uh, saw her. As I continue reading on, it says, Who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother. Explaining Rebekah's lineage. Rebekah is born to Bethuel. And Bethuel is actually the son of Milcah. And Milcah is actually the wife of Nahor. And Nahor is actually Abraham's brother. So you can see that basically... She is the, uh, let's see right here, she is the granddaughter of Nahor. That's the idea. She is the granddaughter of Nahor, and Nahor is Abraham's brother. Continuing on, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. So Rebecca, as she comes to uh, draw water for the camels, she had a pitcher, she was carrying a pitcher along with her. So she's about to draw water. And the damsel was very fair to look upon. I'm going to move this side. Uh, let me know if I'm cut off. Uh, continuing on, let's see here. Uh, here we are, the, verse 16, And the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin, neither had any man known her. 
All right, that's self-explanatory. This young woman, this damsel, is very beautiful. She's fair to look at. She's also a virgin. She's pure. She's chaste. She didn't know any man sexually. So that's what known means. Known means uh, sexual knowing. The first thing about Rebecca. So we're going to look at several cases here on Rebecca, what she is likened to. Now, this is for you ladies. You'd want to hear about this. I'd encourage a women's Bible study just on this chapter. There's a lot you can learn from Rebecca for you single ladies that you can learn from, or young women in general. So Rebecca, there's a lot of things to learn from her. She typifies undoubtedly the Christian church. So that's even more so for the women to learn from. You can see some good traits of a good godly woman. At the same time, how a Christian or the church should act. So this is a very good Bible study that I'd recommend some woman to do. If we look at Genesis chapter 24, verse 16, the first thing about Rebecca that we know about her is that she is beautiful. So, no, Christian women are not ugly women, okay? As a matter of fact, if you look at the majority, this is surprising, the majority of verses that you look at throughout your Bible about uh, the women of the Bible, most of them are actually fair and beautiful, believe it or not, most of them. So people would say, you know, when you become a Christian, you're not beautiful, you know, modest apparel and women, you know, they just have to look like sailors where they have no makeup on, you know, some holiness Pentecostal women whose hair grows up to their ankles, you know, some weird, some weird stuff like that, little house on the prairie. No, that's not how the Bible, that's not how the Bible typifies women. Notice that she is very beautiful. Right. She is very beautiful. Right. And for women to put, uh, heavily put on makeup and to put on uh, immodest apparel to show their beauty must show that they must not be beautiful women. All right, that, that'll preach right there, okay? All right, but I'm not going to park it right there because I might get into trouble, okay? <laughs> so she is very beautiful, but with her beauty, she does not use it where the world trashes and uses her beauty like many women unfortunately have fallen into in Hollywood yeah. nowadays going to modeling and then to be an actress and then you hear horror stories I mean you didn't even hear a, a hundredth of it but what you hear about the Harvey Weinstein and those sex scandals coming out that's even one of a hundredth you have no idea right. how women are preyed upon there right. I mean deeply preyed upon so then instead of letting her beauty be wasted and trashed by the world, she maintains its purity. Okay. Now, let me ask you women this. If you're so beautiful and you have a purity, why would you trash it for the world? You're too good for that. You're too good for that. A man should be very, very special for you if you're going to uh, one day get married should be used by that one person. You might say, why? Because that's how uh, highly prized and favored you should be. Right. You shouldn't be the type of person whose beauty is just wasted away and displayed by the world and trash. You should be so prized and valued. You should be a very beautiful woman who's uh, very prized and valued. And basically, you should be hard to get, so to speak, by the world. You should be very uh, hard to get. Only one person should have it. And that's only God. Only a God could provide that for you. That's how, that's how hard you should be to get. That's how hard you should be to catch. Why? Because you deserve it. You deserve it. Especially how the Lord made you to be. Purity. And that's how the church is typified. Undoubtedly, we see an example of the church. Go to the book of 2 Corinthians. The book of 2 Corinthians. And uh, let me know if I'm cut off, okay? we got the book of 2 Corinthians. And we'll look at chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. That's okay. Thank you. So 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, notice that the church, its beauty has been wasted by the devil, by this wicked world. Uh, the church should maintain its purity. Do you have a pure practice? 
pure doctrine, pure, uh, pure uh, living, pure living. Uh, like I told you, my mind's not all there today, okay? So if I go a little slow, then <laughs> just bear with me. That's why we emphasize very heavily on right doctrine, right practice, and things that we do things in this church. Some people might complain, well, I do that in other churches. Why can't I do that here in this church? Because we want to maintain what's pure. Right. All right? We want to maintain what's pure. Right. This church should be unlike other churches. Churches have trash nowadays where they let the world use them however they want. Right. No, we should make it very hard for the world to get to us. Right. That's how we should be. Yep. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Wow. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Notice that the church has been corrupted, tainted by the devil. Uh, go back to Genesis 24. Genesis 24. We're going to compare a lot with the church. So I'm going to put, let's see right here, I think right here would be a good place to put it. I'm going to put the church here. Uh, let me know if I'm cut off. Is it cut off? No? No. All right then. So we're going to show how the church is typified in this example. One, it's chaste. It's pure. Right. We see a lot of the pictures of the church. Continuing on. Verse 17, uh, verse 16, the last part of it. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. So uh, Rebecca, she went down to where the well was. Then she filled her pitcher. So she had to go down where her pitcher would fill it up and then came up. Meaning that it was like a hole. So it may not really be like what this drawing displays, but it's like a hole where she has to go down and then uh, use her pitcher to draw up the water. That's what some commentators have mentioned. Continuing on, the verse reads, And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. So Eliezer, the servant, he runs to meet Rebekah and then says to her, uh, Allow me, uh, please let me drink a little water from your pitcher. I pray thee means uh, I beg you, I ask. And then what does she say at verse 18? And she said, Drink, my Lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. So she answers, Drink. And she uh, notice that she's very respectful to him. She calls him my Lord. So notice that uh, unlike uh, today's very very so-called independent women today where she goes uh, she doesn't say you male shabbiness or whatever she, what she does is she respects him nowadays women they want respect but they don't respect other people right uh, you go to this is a day and age where everybody wants respect by playing a victim card that's how low you stoop yep. you stoop so low to gain respect by becoming a victim and use that victimization card and some majority or some yeah. dominant class or dominant gender or whatever uh, picking on me so I deserve respect uh, no not if you're that weak and pathetic yeah. not if you're that weak and pathetic yeah. you earn your way okay but anyways, the point is, is that we live in a day and age where we lost total respect. And uh, we have to live in a day and age where we respect. Uh, men should never abuse their wives. And the Bible says that uh, we should honor the wives. So men honor the women, but also the women honor the men. We live in a day and age where we lost respect. So notice that she's respectful of other people. That's one thing nice about her. Now, a lot of these things is going to match with the Proverbs 31 woman. We're not going to compare with Proverbs 31. But whatever I write here, I like to encourage the women to compare that with Proverbs 31 in your own time. And then you see a lot of the good traits of a virtuous woman or the Proverbs 31 wife. Number three, notice that she was energetic. Did you, do you see that right there? Like, she was enthusiastic. 
to help out. She wasn't like, uh, I, I guess I'll write my name in the volunteer sheet, you know. She wasn't like, oh, that's a lot of work, you know, getting water down that hole. And when I worked so hard for my, no, 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 no. Notice that she was enthusiastic. How many women do we have that nowadays? Oh, it's quiet. Okay, Let me, that means I should continue on. I should continue on. <laughs> All right, verse. I'm not in the safe zone right now, so let me just keep commenting. All right. Notice, notice in verse 19, and when she had done giving him drink, she said, wow, get under conviction right here. I will draw water for thy camels also. No, you crazy. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> when she gave him, when she had finished giving uh, giving him water to drink, she replies, I'm going to draw water for your camels as well. Now, you know how much water one camel drinks, right? Now, imagine a whole caravan. That's insane. She says that she's going to draw water for the camels until they have done drinking. That's a lot of enthusiasm. That's a lot of service she does. That's a very good woman. So notice how God answered mightily Eliezer's prayer. So she was feeding uh, the camels water and not just hurrying up to give camels water, but until they finish drinking themselves. That's quite a woman. Verse 19, uh, let's see. Uh, verse 20, And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again unto the well to draw water. So she hurried up. She hasted. She was very energetic. She emptied her, uh, her pitcher into the trough. So then where the camels were drinking into the trough, she emptied all that water, then ran again back to the well to draw water again. Going down and picking up, that's, that's a lot of energy. Right. She's got to be tired after doing that. And drew for all of his camels. She drew water for all of his camels. Verse 21, And the man wondering at her held his peace. So what did the servant do? He was observing all that time, studying her out. He, was, he wondered. He was also at a wonder. It's like, you don't meet a girl like this every day. Right. This is a rare find. Uh, he held his peace, meaning he was quiet that whole time. To wit, whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. So he was... Uh, Wit, to wit means to think. So he was thinking whether the Lord, he prospered his search, his mission for his journey to find a good woman for Isaac. Was it prosperous? Was it successful or no? Verse 22, and it came to pass as the camels had done drinking. So it just, so, uh, and it came to pass, meaning, again, that's a metaphor using, it just so happened when the camels finished drinking water that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of 10 shekels weight of gold. So the servant, he took a golden earring that weighed about half a shekel and then two bracelets and he gave it to her hand and they weighed about 10 shekels of gold. And said, Whose daughter art thou? He asked uh, Rebecca, Whose daughter are you? Tell me, I pray thee, is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? So he says, Please tell me, uh, I ask you, is there room where uh, is there room that I can lodge in at your father's place? So that's what the verse is saying. Verse 24, And she said unto him, so she answers him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which she bare unto Nahor. She replies whose lineage she's from. I'm the daughter of Bethuel. And Bethuel is the son of Milcah. And Milcah, she's the uh, wife of Nahor. Uh, she's the one that gave birth to Bethuel. She said, moreover, unto him, so she continues uh, more, so she continues on to him, we have both straw and provender enough. She says, we have enough straw and animal fodder to feed your camel, she says, and room to lodge in. We also have room for you to lodge in. So her family has enough to provide for the servant and for the men who accompanied him and the entire caravan. 
Verse 26, And the man bowed down his head and worshipped the Lord. Obviously, Eliezer is rejoicing. Like, what are the chances of this? This is within Abraham's family line. Right. And the first woman he bumps across. So he just bows down his head to the ground and then just worships God. Amen. Verse 27, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham. So he just replies while worshiping the Lord. Man, bless his holy name, basically, he's saying. He's saying, blessed be the Lord God of who? Of his own master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. So God did not leave Abraham, his master, destitute. He didn't leave him emptied of God's own mercy and God's own truth. So he always guided him in every step. I, being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. Eliezer saying, God used me in this path, in this way, to lead me into the house of my master Abraham, his own family. What are the chances of that? Blessed be his holy name, he's saying. And the damsel ran and told them of her mother's house these things. So the young woman, Rebecca, she ran. So she's excited herself. She's like, wow, uh, the chance of this happening, a uh, bumping into my family line, Abraham. So she's excited. She runs back to her uh, mother's house and tells her and her family everything that happened. Now notice where a woman who went to draw water, she heard the good news mm -hmm. and ran back yeah. to her family and her people to tell them of this good news. Clearly, as I pointed you out in last Genesis study, there is a connection from the Holy Spirit where it matches with that Samaritan woman in John 4. Go to John 4. John chapter 4. I showed you in the last Genesis study there's clearly a relationship where Eliezer typified the Holy Spirit and where the woman typified the church, Rebecca typified the church, it matched really well with Revelation where the Spirit and the bride. That's what the verse exactly says. That Revelation 22 says, come and take the water of life freely. And John 4, the woman comes to draw water and Jesus says, if only you knew who'd give you water, you'd ask of him. And that's the same water of life Jesus was talking about at Revelation 22, where the Spirit and the bride said, come, take the water of life freely. And that is confirmed at John chapter 7 as well, where Jesus' water offer to the Samaritan woman was that Holy Spirit springing up water of everlasting life. Now look at uh, John chapter 4. Notice what happens here in verse 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. So the story matches very well with Rebecca, where the Samaritan woman ran to her hometown and tells them the good news that she heard from a wanderer, mm -hmm. a person who doesn't live there. He just happened to pass through. Right. Matching with Jesus, who was out of town, and Eliezer, who was out of town. Okay, let's go to Genesis 24. Genesis 24. The next verse reads, 29, And Rebekah had a brother, and his name was Laban. So Rebekah's brother's name was Laban. And Laban ran out unto the man, unto the well. And Laban, uh, when he heard the good news from Rebekah, he ran to meet the man uh, where the well was located. And it came to pass when he saw the earring and bracelets upon his sister's hands. So it's, and it just so happened when Laban saw the earring and bracelets that was on his sister's hand, Rebekah's hands. Oh, that would explain why Laban ran to meet uh, Eliezer. And when he heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, saying, Thus spake the man unto me. So when he heard the, the news from his sister Rebekah, saying, 
so on and so forth, this is what the man said to me. Uh, you'll notice that phrase used throughout the Bible where it says, thus spake the man unto me. It'll say, thus and thus. And that phrase is commonly used as, it just, uh, so the man said, so and so and so, such and such and such. That's the idea, okay? That's the meaning. So Laban hears all this good news, and obviously the riches and Laban... Uh, it's uh, pretty natural that he would know what happened to somebody that's close to him, Abraham, how wealthy he is and all that kind of good stuff. So he would obviously be excited and run to meet him. That he came unto the man. So he, after hearing the, the news, he went to the man, uh, Eliezer. And behold, he stood by the camels at a well. And behold, right there, uh, Eliezer is standing with the camels right at the well, just sitting there and waiting. And he said, Come in, thou blessed of the Lord, wherefore standest thou without? So Laban says, Come on in, come on over. You're, you're a blessing from God. Why? Because they know he has the money. All right? They know he has the money. Like a, like a typical worldly Christian or worldly pastor. And then hears about somebody who has some money and says, Come on in to Lakewood. You're a blessing from God. <laughs> Why? Cha-ching, cha-ching. Yeah, cha-ching, cha-ching. Wherefore standest thou without? Basically, why are you standing outside of our city? Why are you just standing outside here? Come on in. For I have prepared the house and room for the camels. Laban saying that he prepared the house for him and he also has room for his camels. Rebecca, we can see, typifies the church, but she has a relationship. If you know the rest of the story, Rebecca leaves her old family to enter a new family. She leaves her old family, Laban, to go to the new family, Isaac. If Rebecca typifies the church, we can see right here. I don't know if anybody taught this. Uh, if not, then I would be the first here. But from what I notice here is that this typifies Rebecca as the church. The church leaves her old family, the world, to go into the new family, Jesus Christ. Amen. There's no doubt that Laban, he, we can see a lot of the wording here where he typifies the world. Right. He typifies a worldly person. <laughs> Go to 1 John, 1 John. He's an example of loving the world. He's an example of loving the world. Look at the book of 1 John. Yeah. 1 John. Chapter 2 and verse 15. First John chapter 2 and verse 15. So now we look at Laban. Yeah. Rebecca's here. <coughs> Excuse me. And then uh, Laban is right here. Typifies the world. Look at the book, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Clearly, Laban follows this attitude of loving the world. Now go to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Laban noticed that he acts like a Christian. Please come on in, Holy Spirit. Oh, God, work on us. So Eliezer typifies the Holy Spirit, right? Welcoming the Lord as long as it suits his worldly tastes. Now notice that the Word of God, it can, people can be receptive to the Word of God while combining it with the world. Right. As long as there's some kind of worldly gain or function. Look at Hillsong. Right. <coughs> Look at the mega churches. Why is it that people have no problem receiving Jesus? Because it's so worldly that you get news media reporters saying about Hillsong, look at the lineup. It's like a rock concert. Right. Okay, Matthew chapter 13. Notice at verse 22. <coughs> he also that received seed among the thorns 
is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, Laban, choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. Laban. Right there. Okay, go back to Genesis. Go back to Genesis 24. Laban, he really typifies the world right here. Let's look at Genesis chapter 24. And then we'll read verse 32. And the man came into the house. So Eliezer went inside their house and he ungirded his camels. So that's uh, pretty obvious to understand. It, the camels, they have their own girdle. So uh, they ungirded uh, Eliezer's camels. Uh, unloosed the straps and everything that the camels were wearing around their waist and gave straw and provender for the camels. So they gave straw and animal fodder to the, cannibal, uh, the, the camels, not cannibals, the camels. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm tired, okay, as you can say. Uh, and water to wash his feet and the men's feet that were with him. So they washed the feet of Eliezer and the men who accompanied Eliezer, they washed their feet as well. And there was set meat before him to eat. So they put meat, a huge feast, in front of Eliezer to eat. But he said, I will not eat until I have told mine Aaron. Eliezer, however, responds, I'm, I can't eat until I tell you, mine Aaron, what I came here for, what my task is. And he said, speak on. So we can probably guess that Laban's the one who's answering, since the whole context is about Laban. So Laban tells, uh, tells Eliezer to keep on speaking, to say his, uh, say his piece. This is a good passage. If you recall, uh, credit to whom credit's due, right? So uh, pastors Mike Reagan and Mike Fernandez, phenomenal speakers, as you might already know. Very phenomenal speakers. Uh, I could be wrong about this, but one thing I notice is that before they preach the word, they don't eat. Yeah. They do not eat. And uh, if uh, majority of revival meetings I go to, you eat yourself silly, and then, okay, here you go, you preach with the full stomach. But there are some preachers who don't. And I think that there is something significant and something very special about that. Look at the book of John 4. John 4. Now, I'm not saying that uh, these preachers, that they profess to be more spiritual. No, I'm actually saying it for them. I think that there's something very special and spiritual about that. So I'll just say it for them. Look at the book of John chapter 4. And I don't practice that. I just eat and then preach. You might say, why? Because I'm just going to collapse, all right? You, you see my shape. If I don't have nutrient, I am just going to collapse when I preach. I don't care how spiritual or how much the Holy Spirit feeds me. I just collapse, okay? Yeah. I just collapse. And the Lord Jesus will receive my spirit up in glory. That happens, okay? Now let's look at John chapter 4. Now look at what Jesus did. Look at verse 31. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But how does Jesus respond? But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. So he refuses to eat the physical meat. Why? Because he wants to replace the physical meat with the spiritual meat. Keep reading. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to what? Finish his work. He prized the spiritual food more and until he finishes that, yes. then he accomplished his spiritual mate. Then you can do whatever physical thing you want after that. Why? Because he was giving what? He was preaching the word. He was preaching the word. You'll notice that at verse, let's see right here. If you look at verse um, 41, yeah, there, uh, 40 and 41, he was preaching the word. You'll also notice at verse uh, 6 all the way down through 30, uh, to verse 30, Jesus was preaching the word. So during that time, he wanted to focus on the spiritual meat, not the physical meat. 
Uh, that is very possible because, remember, one of the spiritual signs is fasting, right? Fasting. Why? So that the flesh can be crucified and that you can be more focused on... Uh, you can be more focused and centered about the Holy Spirit moving you rather than how your flesh craves for. If you focus more on what your spirit craves for rather than what your flesh craves for, the best testing, one of the best testing grounds is fasting. One of the best testing grounds is fasting because it makes you, uh, it, uh, that's a very good experiential moment to do so. So, uh, if you were to try that in preaching, it might do wonders, all right? But you don't have to be uh, dumb or hyper-spiritual where you're starving to death and where you do need nutrients. And then if you preach and you do a sloppy job, you got no one to blame but yourself. Right. Uh, everyone has uh, different callings and ways of doing things. However, this is one of the things, uh, one of the recommendations, if you're able to, to try. It's the same thing like fasting and praying. It's not recommended for those if they're sick or frail or if they need nutrients. But fasting and praying is one of those spiritual recommendations. However, it's not uh, pushed where everyone does it, especially those with, who are frail in health or it costs more harm than good. Right. That's why fasting and praying is the same thing like uh, preaching before uh, physically eating. It's something you have to take it to the Lord in prayer and be wise about. Right. Amen. So between you and the Lord. Amen. I'd recommend people to try that out, to pray to the Lord and see what happens. Amen, brother. That's good. Because notice that Eliezer, he's speaking all the important stuff that is uh, from the Lord about uh, his master Abraham and Isaac. He gives the word first before eating. And the food can go cold, he don't care. He'll just talk. Verse 34, and he said, I am Abraham's servant. So he declares himself to be the servant of Abraham. Notice two things here on Eliezer of typifying the Holy Spirit. Two things you can notice right here is one, uh, the Holy Spirit brags about the Father yeah. and the Son. Notice in this passage there's a bragging about the Father and the Son. Isn't that in the church age today where the Holy Spirit's job is not to praise itself, but rather on the Father and the Son? That's the thing you got to watch out for these charismatic churches where they talk about, Oh, Holy Spirit, breathe upon me, or dear Holy Spirit, and they pray to the Holy Spirit. No, that's not, then they're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Because if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the tension and the bragging would go on the Father and the Son. Now, I'm not going uh, to show you this passage, but I already showed you that passage at John 14 and 16. In our last Genesis study, if you look at John 14 and 16, the Holy Spirit's job is to put the praise and the glory about the Father and the Son. Yeah. Now notice all that. Notice all that at verse 34, 35 and onward. And the Lord hath blessed my master greatly. So he's saying that God has richly and greatly blessed his master Abraham. Notice it's about the Father here. Yeah. And he has become great. He's bragging about Abraham, the Father becoming great. And he hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. <coughs> Notice that the servant is bragging about the possessions of his master Abraham, the Father having flocks, herds, silver, gold, men servants, maid servants, camels and donkeys and mansions up in the hilltop and gold, yeah. silver, precious yeah. stones at the judgment. And he's just bragging about what the Father owns. Right. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills, as one song says. Yeah. And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old. So he's saying that Sarah, who is the, his own master's wife, gave birth to a son to his master Abraham, even though she was up in years, she was old. And unto him hath he given all that he hath. Oh, that's a good wording right here. Notice that the father gives all that he has to his son. Do you see that there? Yeah. Uh, we look at the book of John 17. Go to John 17. Yeah. There is no doubt too much Christian application right here. Okay, John 17. Book of John, chapter 17. 
<clears throat> so then the father, all that the father has, father's all given to the son. Yeah. Uh, let me know if I'm cut off. You're cut off. Yeah. This for son? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Is that fine? Mm -hmm. All right, then. Look at John 17. Notice what Jesus says. Jesus says that all that he has is given from the Father, but then uh, the Son, he's able to own it. Verse 7, uh, verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them, un them me, yeah. and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. Notice right there that Jesus says what uh, the Father has is given to him. <clears throat> verse 10, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine and I am glorified in them. Uh, if you keep reading down John chapter 17, there's a lot more where Jesus keeps saying that whatever the Father has given to me, I own. Verse 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with uh, me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. For thou hast loved me before the foundation of the world. So notice right here that Jesus says that the Father, whatever he has, is given to the Son. Okay, going back, going back. <clears throat> there is no doubt that all of this pictures a lot of Christian application. Right. Continuing onward, verse 37, And my master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife uh, to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, so mean, in whose land I dwell. So Abraham, uh, Eliezer's master, made him swear, made him promise, you're not going to uh, take a wife from my son Isaac from the Canaanites, one of their women, one of their daughters, which is the land that I'm currently living in. That's what Abraham says. But thou shalt go unto my father's house and to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son. Abraham tells El Eliezer, you're going to go to my uh, family's homeland and you're going to go to my kindred, my family members there, my people, and you're going to find a wife for my boy Isaac from that land. And I said unto my master, peradventure the woman will not follow me. Eliezer says to Abraham, his master, uh, what if, that's what peradventure means, what if it just so happens that this woman's not going to come with me? And he said unto me, The Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with thee. Abraham says to his servant Eliezer <clears throat> that God before whom I walk, meaning wherever Abraham went, God was always present with him. So that ever present God will also bestow his same, uh, his same ever presence to Eliezer, that's the idea, will send his angel with thee and prosper thy way. So as much as God was with me wherever I went, he's going to send his angel to follow you uh, wherever you go, and wherever you go, you'll prosper. And thou shalt take a wife for my son, of my kindred, and of my father's house. So Eli uh, Abraham says to Eliezer, you're going to find me a wife for my son Isaac in my people, my family members, homeland. Then shalt thou be clear from this my oath when thou comest to my kindred, and if they give not thee one, and thou shalt be clear from my oath. Meaning that, <clears throat> Eliezer, uh, you're going to be clear from my oath. You don't have to keep the promise anymore if it just so happens when you come to see my family, my homeland, and they don't give you a wife. Then you can be cleared. Verse 42, And I came this day unto the well, and said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if now thou do prosper my way which I go, behold, I stand by the well of water, and it shall come to pass that when the virgin cometh forth to draw water, 
And I say to her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water of thy pitcher to drink. And she say to me, Both drink thou, and I will also draw for thy camels. Let the same be the woman whom the Lord hath appointed out for my master's son. Okay, now notice that 42 and onward, it is all self-explanatory. But I will explain each and every word because I, uh, I promised that I would do that. So follow along with me. I'm going to explain those few verses I read. So see if my explanation matches. <clears throat> so Eliezer is saying that uh, he came this day. Today, I went to the well, and then I prayed to God, the Lord God of my master Abraham. Uh, if you're going to succeed wherever I go, then behold, okay, so pay attention to this part right here, God. That's the metaphor. Behold, I'm going to stand by this well that has water, and it's just going to, if it so happens to be when the young woman, the virgin, she's chaste, she's pure, <clears throat> She comes to uh, draw water, to pick up water, and then I say to her, please uh, give me a little water from thy pitcher to drink. And she responds to me that I'm going to give you water to drink, but not just you, also your camels. Let this be the same woman that you chose, God, for uh, Isaac, my master's son. And before I had done speaking in my heart, behold, Rebekah came forth with her pitcher on her shoulder, and she went down unto the well and drew water. And I said unto her, Let me drink, I pray thee. And she made haste and let down her pitcher from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. <clears throat> So I drank, and she made the camels drink also. All right, I'm going to explain every word here. So before he even finished his uh, prayer in his heart to God, lo and behold, what happened? Rebecca, she suddenly came out with the pitcher on her shoulder. She went to the well to get water. I asked her, please uh, give me water. And she hurried. She didn't hesitate. She uh, went down that hole, let down her pitcher from her shoulder, and she told told me, drink, and I'm also going to give your camels drink. And I drank, and she also made sure my camels had a good drink. And I asked, her, verse 47, And I asked her and said, Whose daughter art thou? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bare unto him. And I put the earring upon her face and the bracelets upon her hands. So Eliezer asked her, and said, now, whose daughter are you? What family lineage are you from? She answers, I'm the daughter of Bethuel. Bethuel is Nahor's son. And then Bethuel is actually born from Milcah. And then when the servant heard that, he put the earring on her face and the bracelets on her hands. Now, what does that mean? It means what it says, okay? Your ears are a part of your face. Yeah. So she put the earrings on her face. Now, some of these brilliant scholars are just so dumb that they say, oh, it doesn't make sense that she put the earring on her face, so it must have been a nose ring. <laughs> your ear is a part of your face, so... Yeah. Okay? That's too deep. By the way, okay, <clears throat> if, they, if they think that, no, it has to be literally right here, not something as a proximity or close to it. Well, what about the hands then, you fool? Yeah. Well, you got, she got bracelets on her hand. What has she got? Like finger rings or something like that? Yeah. So, uh, when the Bible talks about that they pierced my hands and my feet, yeah. the wrist was a part of the hand because it's in proximity of the hand. Right. Same thing with the ears. It's in proximity of the face, so it's part of the face. Now look at Exodus 32. Notice how the Holy Spirit makes a fool out of the scholars. Well, the Hebrew word is... No, 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 no. Look at the Bible. Don't pull Hebrew and Greek on me, buddy. You just look at the Bible. See what it says. Look at Exodus 32 and Isaiah 3. Look at Isaiah 3 and Exodus 32. Scholars make you laugh every time. Whenever they say the Greeks say, you should laugh. You should laugh every time they say the Greek says, okay? Look at Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. Look at verse 2. Verse 2. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives. Oh, so these are earrings that are in the ears, right? In the ears, right? Guess what? That same Hebrew word 
Golden earrings is the same Hebrew word that you find right here at Genesis 24 when he said, I put the earrings on her face. That's the same Hebrew word. Earring is an earring. Yeah, yeah. In Hebrew, too. <laughs> Go to Isaiah 3. <clears throat> Go to Isaiah 3. Look, God's going to tell you what's an earring and what's a nose ring, okay? God will tell you. Go to Isaiah 3, verse 20. Look how the Holy Spirit words this. Isaiah 3, 20. Yeah. Yeah. The bonnets and the ornaments of the legs and the headbands and the tablets and the what? Earrings, the rings, and what? Nose, Nose jewels. Oh. Yeah. Oh, there's a difference. Yeah. Yeah. There's a difference. Okay, go back. Yeah. We're done, right? Yeah. All right, go to Genesis 24. I don't have to expound on that. That's good stuff. All right. Amen. Let's go to... Genesis 24. Now, if you, if you, uh, what a beautiful fair woman with a nose ring drawing water, right? <laughs> all right, so I guess that's what they were all picturing. Okay. These must be Calvary Chapel, non denominational, yeah. mega church, worldly churches, probably. Yeah. All right, let's look at Genesis chapter 24, and then we'll read verse, let's see right here. We're going to read verse 30. Oh, where am I at again? I'm at 40, right? 40 something. Thank you. All right. So I am at 48. Thank you. All right. 48. And I bow down my head and worship the Lord and bless the Lord God of my master Abraham. So uh, Eliezer was obviously rejoicing. He bowed down his head. He Worship God. He blessed uh, the God of his master Abraham, which had led me in the right way to take my master's brother's daughter unto his son. And now if ye will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me, and if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Okay, so the second half of verse 48, what it's saying right here is that he's blessing God. Uh, He's praising the God of his master Abraham, the one who guided him, led him in the right path to find and to take his ma uh, in, ma in Abraham's family lineage. What are the chances of that happening? God uh, guided him toward the right steps to let that happen. Basically, his family is his master's brother's daughter. So Abraham's brother's daughter for what? For his son uh, Isaac. Now remember that daughter can mean daughter and granddaughter. I've established that in my previous Genesis studies when we went through Abraham's lineage. I'm not going to do that here. Verse 49, uh, what it's saying right here, so now if you will deal kindly and truly with my master, meaning that if you would be so kind and, you know, if you would uh, do this for my master Abraham, truly is like certainly surety. So if you can do this for sure, and if you can be so kind to do this for Abraham, please tell me, all right? Give me your answer right now. And if you won't give me the answer yes, then let me know about that too. Tell me now. That way I know what to do, where to go. That's why that phrase that I may turn to the right hand or to the left, that phrase means, uh, that means I can know where to go, right. what to do next. Right. <clears throat> 50, then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, the thing proceedeth from the Lord, we cannot speak unto thee bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before thee, take her and go, and let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord has spoken. Meaning that Laban and Bethuel, now remember, Bethuel is the father, okay? Rebekah's father. So her brother and father, they both answered Eliezer that, you know, this is from God, so we can't say anything bad or anything good about it. Behold, so... The idea is, uh, pay attention to this part of what I'm going to say. Rebecca is uh, before your presence. She's right here. Go ahead and take her. Let her be your master's son's wife. Let her be Isaac's wife. As God spoke, as the Lord has spoken. Now Laban, we can see here that 
he also has a power play. It's not just the father. The son also has some kind of role or dominance. During the uh, earlier times, remember the men had more of a powerful role, so it's the father, but then the people who took after the father, right? So when the father's passing away, then it would be the sons. That's the reason why Laban had more of a, a dominant role play here, and he had a word to say. Verse 52, And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshipped the Lord, bowing himself to the ground. So, it just so happened when Ab Eliezer, Abraham's servant, heard what Laban and Bethuel said, their words, he again thanked the Lord. He worshipped God and he bowed himself to the ground again. And the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah. He gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. So Eliezer the servant, he brought jewels, silver and gold and extra clothing, gave them to Rebekah. And in addition, he also gave it to Laban and then to Rebekah's mom, many precious things. Two pictures here. One is, go to the book of Revelation 19. Uh, actually, Revelation 3 is better. Revelation 3. And then Ephesians 1, and we'll close it here. Ephesians 1 and Revelation 19. All right, two more pictures, and shall we close it off? So two more pictures here that you can notice. Four is how the Holy Spirit bestows the rewards and clothing to the church so that the bride can be decorated in garments. Look at Revelation chapter 3. The Bible says at verse 17, because thou, uh, verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. If you compare that with Revelation 19, it's talking about the bride, the wife of Jesus Christ, where she is adorned in white garments. Like the bride is adorned. Rebecca is adorned with the jewelry at Genesis 24. But not just that. Notice that the servant made a down payment to her old family, sealing the deal that basically that the bride will belong to the son. Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1. So, picturing the church getting a down payment from the Holy Spirit to the, to the old family, to the world, that, hey, she belongs to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. In whom he also trusted after that he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that he believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. After you got saved, the Holy Spirit sealed you. Yeah. But when he sealed you, verse 14, which is the what? Yeah. Earnest of our inheritance. Yeah. Earnest is basically that down payment made. Yeah. Yeah. That's, the, uh, that's the meaning of earnest of our inheritance. Until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. So notice a down payment to this world. So the world... Laban, our old family, when we were lost in sin, can't hold us down. Right. The Holy Spirit already made a down payment. She belongs to the Son. Yeah. The church belongs to the church belongs to Jesus Christ. So guess what? The world can't hold us down for the tribulation, for its wrath. God already made a down payment. We're going to be raptured up to heaven. The bride will go up to heaven to be with the Son, Jesus Christ. Why? He already did an earnest of the inheritance. Okay, let's close with a word of prayer. Uh, Father, thank you so much for the truth of thy word. And thank you so much that we can glean many understandings and riches. What a precious book in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.